In today's video, we're going to introduce, reintroduce the topic of solutions, um, aqueous solutions, electrolytes, and solution concentrations. So we're just going to go through some terms and review some math that we need to be familiar with. First off, a solution. A solution, if you remember, and we've defined some of these already, is going to be a homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. Okay, so remember a mixture, homogeneous, you cannot see the parts and pieces. So that's what solution is going to be. Only one perceptible phase. So typically, most of the time, we talk about something being dissolved in liquid, but it doesn't matter necessarily. Uh, species do not react chemically. Okay, so there's a few different examples here, but you know, you could physically separate them. Now some examples here, if you have two solids together in an alloy, for example, brass is an example of this where you heat up the two metals, you get them to mix, you let it cool, and an alloy is um, a mixture of different metals that typically make it stronger. That's what makes it more valuable to it. Um, liquids, you know, you've got mercury in tin right here. Um, you also, liquid and solid right here, you could get, mercury is one of the only metals that's liquid at room temperature. Um, liquid, alcohol, and water. Um, carbon dioxide and water is when there's a gas in a liquid. And then in the atmosphere, pure air is gaseous, gaseous. So although we typically talk about a solid being dissolved, it's dissolved in a liquid, this is just some other examples that we're not as familiar with. Now aqueous solution then is going to be the solid, liquid, or gas dissolved into liquid water. So this is again when we have salt water, when we have carbon dioxide. I don't want to see that message again. Now there's always two parts to every solution. The solvent is what is being what it is being dissolved in. Typically it's the component in the greater quantity um, or the larger volume. There's a couple different ways to say that. And obviously if we're talking about aqueous this is going to be our water. Now the other part then is going to be our solute. This is what is being dissolved. And again when we think about solutions on a molecular level because we're not chemically converting them, really all we're talking about, like if here comes the salt water into the water, all that's happening is that for this particular situation, the salt and the chlor sodium and the chloride would separate and they both would just be surrounded by water molecules. Okay, and so that's all that we get when something gets dissolved, the water is essentially surrounding them. And we're going to talk about intermolecular forces and why those attractions occur a little bit later, but that's the essence of when something is in a solution. Now when something is miscible, this is a fancy word for saying the degree to which a solute will dissolve in a solvent. We've seen this term before um, be, because it typically refers to liquid-liquid solutions. Okay, so for example, when we saw the alcohol and the water, those are two solutions that are actually able to be mixed together, so those would be miscible immiscible is substances that do not mix. And the classic example here is our oil and water. When you take um, the Italian dressing out of the fridge, there's usually a very clear separation, right, where you will have the oil and you will have the water. And this is all going to come down to, if you think about types of, mo of molecules, the oil is nonpolar. So here's throwing out some old terms here. Nonpolar is only going to have London dispersion forces for intermolecular forces. The water is polar. Water um, has both hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and actually London dispersion as well. And we'll get into this more later, but the reason they do not mix is simply due to the intermolecular forces. If they're not the same, they will not mix together. They don't like each other. It doesn't work. Okay, now if something is soluble, this is generally reserved to the, for the extent to which a solid or gaseous solute will actually dissolve in a liquid solvent. So in other words, will it dissolve or not? And we've talked about solubility rules. You guys have already covered this a little bit, but this is our rules that we're going to find out later. is also based on some math as to where those numbers come from. Um, one thing that is important here is that with our concentrated solutions is that terms are not interchangeable with what's called strong and, and weak. For when we talk about concentrated, there's a very large amount of solute per solvent. Dilute, there's a relatively small amount of solute per um, solvent. Like concentrated, um, you know, you can also get saturated sometimes if you reach the maximum amount. 
but this is also another reminder that this is not this does not have to do with strong and weak. We're going to talk about this later. Um, strong and weak simply is going to refer to will it electrolyze or not. Concentrated and dilute is a, simply a reflection of how much is in there. Okay, now nature of aqueous solutions. Um, one of the first guys to study solutions was Arrhenius. Arrhenius thought that conductivity came from the presence of ions. Now remember, ions are your charged particles. You've got your cations that are positively charged, your anions that are negatively charged. And the level of conductivity does depend directly, okay, remember direct relationship means if one goes up, the other goes up, on how many ions are present. So in other words, more ions, more conductivity. Vice versa. Okay? So the first thing then we gotta uh, define electrolytes. Strong electrolytes conduct electricity very efficiently, and that is because all of the solute particles will break apart into ions. Okay, will break apart into ions. These are the things that when you do in ionics, this is what you split. Okay, this is gonna be your strong acids. You have to have those six memorized, our strong bases that are our group one, typically our group one and two metal hydroxides, so either MOH for group one, MOH two for group twos, and also our soluble salts. So again, here come our solubility rules. And again, the three big biggies that you want to remember for solubility rules: you all, sodium is always soluble, potassium is always soluble, nitrate's always soluble. Those are kind of the big ones that help govern a lot of that stuff. Now weak electrolytes, these are conduct electricity only slightly. Um, a, a few solute particles will create ions. So you'll notice over here, you know, this actually probably could be, well, no, I won't even go there right now. Um, these might be your positives and your negatives, but you'll notice that a lot of them are still in molecular form, as opposed to back over here where everything had split into an ion. Okay, so just some comparison there. Um, oops. These will be our weak acids and our weak bases. I know last year, weak acid is anything that's not on that list that has hydrogen out front. Weak bases, I know last year we focused only on ammonia. We're going to get into more of the organic bases as well this year, and we're going to talk about acids and bases in this unit. Non-electrolytes will not conduct electricity, hence the non, the beginning there. Um, they do not have solute particles that create ions. However, they still, um, I'm going to say, can dissolve because not all of them will be soluble. This will include soluble but non-ionic compounds. Remember if it's non-ionic then we're talking about a molecule. So for example sugar is one that kind of always stumps us. When you dump sugar into solution, okay, it, it doesn't split. It doesn't have any ions. So although sugar will dissolve, what you just get, if I use this S as my sugar molecule, okay, it will still dissolve and be separated, but sugar it does not have a charge on it, so it's a non-electrolyte. And the way that we test that is with these electric, electrical conductors, conductivity testers. Um, for example, you know this is um, methyl alcohol right here. So if you mix methyl alcohol in water, methyl alcohol is a molecule, so it's not ionic. So it is going to be a non-electrolyte. It will not conduct any electricity. Sodium chloride over here will conduct electricity. It's a strong electrolyte, and the solute will consist of two ions, sodium and chloride. And then over here, this is going to be acetic acid. Acetic acid is a weak acid, so a few of them will be charged particles. A lot of them stay the same, and so therefore it just has a little tiny light bulb. So bright light for strong, no light for non, little light bulb for weak. All right, here again are some of the common strong oh, acids and bases. Here you've got your six strong that we just have to memorize. Perchloric is the one that everyone not likes to forget, but does forget. Our strong bases, here you have your group one hydroxides. Um, weak acids, again, is every, anything else that's not on the list. And then ammonia. Um, another thing that you're going to see a little bit of this year and we'll focus on it, is some of these compounds that you're looking at going, man, there's no hydrogen, okay? But they also will act as acids, and I'll, I'll kind of show you why as we go on. So again, we're going to expand our definition a little bit of 
where our acids come from and what can act as an acid as well as what can act as a base. Now the next thing we got the last thing we got to talk about is um, composition of solutions. And when we define concentration, typically concentration is the grams or moles of solute per unit of solution or solvent. So grams or moles of solute per whatever unit we have of solution or solvent. And um, there's actually a, a couple of different terms for this. We're only going to focus on molarity. So here are some different solution, common expressions of concentration. Molarity we saw last year, capital M. Molality, mass percent is something that we still can do. We did a lot of mass percent stuff in unit one. but um, And then you've got parts per trillion, parts per million, parts per billion, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. But right now we're going to focus on molarity. Now molarity is the moles of solute per liters of solution. Just as a reminder, we should remember this is just another way to get in and out of um, in and out of moles. Typically, you know, also another thing to remember is that if you're it's given to you in grams, you just have to convert from grams to moles and then to convert it out. Um, but molarity is another way that you can get from volume to moles on our little stoichiometry chart. So we'll end up having to do this a lot. So for example, calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 1.56 grams of gaseous hydrochloric acid in enough water to make 26.8 milliliters of solution. Okay, I've already done the math down here, but here is just our molar mass of hydrochloric acid. 1.56 divided by 36.46 gets us to 4.28. Then the only trick here in order to actually figure out the molarity, here's our moles per liter. You had to make sure that you took 26.8 and you converted it to liters first. And if you don't remember how to do that, oops, up here, that would have simply been 26.8 milliliters divided by 1,000. Okay, and that's where we get the 2.68 times 10 to the negative second. Um, the good news at this point, you do not have to show me the work for just moving the decimal place, which I know some of you would be really happy with. Okay, now, this is another molarity example, and you'll notice I'm taking these from the textbook if you, want to, if you actually want to go back and see more detail of these problems, okay? But this one says, give the concentration of each type of ion in a 0.5 molar cobalt-2 nitrate solution. So when cobalt-2 nitrate splits, if you think about our ionic equations we used to write last year, for every mole of this compound you're going to get one cobalt-2 and you're going to get two nitrates. Why? Well, because there's a two out here. So I'm going to get two of them. So to figure out the moles of cobalt-2, all I have to do is take the solution, which I just found, I found this in the last problem, it is a 0.5 molar Oh no, here it is. It's got give me 0.5 molar, and I just multiply it by the moles. Now for cobalt, I realize it's a one-to-one, -one and it's exactly the same, but I still want you to write it out, because if not, you're going to get caught on one of these, where for this particular substance, in every mole of cobalt-2, there's two moles of nitrate. So when we look at how much nitrate is present, it's actually going to be 1.0. It's going to be twice as much, simply from the fact that in the very original equation, there was a 2 down here. And this is going to be hugely important in this unit. So if you don't get this, go back to the textbook, read through again, and then ask me. Okay, the last thing we got to do is what's called standard solutions or dilutions. This is, we did this one as well. Um, there's several examples in the textbook, page 145 to 148. But our dilution equation is M1V1 equals M2V2, which we saw last year. So if we think about an example, we want to know what volume of 16 molar sulfuric acid is going to be used to prepare 1.5 liters of 0 0.10 molar sulfuric acid. Okay, we set it up. I'm going to run out of time here, so I apologize if it gets cut off. M1V1 equals M2V2. So we'd set it up as 0.16. Remember, it does not actually matter which set you call M1 or V1 or M2 or V2. I've got 1.5. Okay, if I do this math, my volume is going to come out to be 0.094 liters. And I'll walk you 